Welcome to our annual economic forum. Once again, sponsored, the prime sponsor, JMB, supporting sponsors, National, GB Energy, um, DRT, and Pegasus. This today, we're going to look at global expectations. We thought it would be a good topic to look at today, so we've We've, we have some very exciting speakers lined up. First, I'm going to ask our president, Mr. Paul B. Scott, to give us welcome and opening remarks, followed right after by greetings from Senator the Honorable Kamina Johnson-Smith, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. Mr. Sri Ramaswamy, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, Senator the Honorable Kamina Johnson-Smith, PSOJ executives and guest panelists, the sponsors, the JMMB Group, Continental Baking Company, GB Energy, DRT Communications, Lux for Lux Marketing and the Jamaica Pegasus Hotel, and the general PSOJ membership and other invited guests. Good morning. This room absolutely looks fantastic, and every time I come to a PSOJ event, I'm just blown away by the combination of the work that both the PSOJ does and the sponsors in putting together a great um, facility. So really, it looks absolutely fantastic. Congratulations to the JMB and the PSOJ for putting, putting this together this morning. It takes me it's great pleasure for me to be here to welcome all of you to the annual JMMB PSOJ Economic Forum, which is themed global expectations, predicting economic trends in an uncertain global environment, environment and impl implications for Jamaican companies. This annual forum every year has enhanced the reputation of both the PSOJ and the JM and JMMB with regard to the development and research of really important topics in Jamaica and has become an annual important event in Jamaica. I think that the topic this year is particularly important because what is happening globally does affect Jamaica. And we in Jamaica and businesses in Jamaica have to accept that while a lot of us are very sort of internally focused, the economic environment that we live in is really formed from outside Jamaica. And there are a lot of events that are occurring almost on a daily basis that are really are affecting our own decisions, although we may, might not be attributing those events to those decisions. When we talk about almost daily where the Jamaican dollar is, which I think is something that all of us in this room and in Jamaica need to consider whether it's the right nar narrative. Because at the end of the day, inflation is a very, very important measurement. But the, where the Jamaican dollar is, is not necessarily the most important measurement. And we tend to be preoccupied in Jamaica with regard to where the Jamaican dollar is. And at the end of the day, inflation management and control of inflation ought to be what we're concerned about, rather than whether the dollar is slipping from 128 to 130. And the dollar is, can slip for various reasons, it can slip for reasons that are completely out of our control, events that can occur elsewhere with regard to Venezuela, for example, or with whether it is Brexit. Um, for example, Brexit, after Brexit, the pound weakened substantially. And as a result of that, there's an effect on the Jamaican dollar. So there are a number of events that have direct effect on Jamaica, because Jamaica is just a small country. We're a small island. And Events in the Middle East that affect oil prices and gas prices have a direct correlation on our JPS bill every single month. So it's important as businesses that we understand what's happening in global trends. And it's, it's important that 
in understanding what's happening, we have the right narrative in Jamaica in order to concentrate on the right things. Because there are certain things that we can control, and there are other things that we just can't. And we must really start to focus on the right things. We've got to focus on inflation, and we have. Inflation is at a much better place than it was five years ago. And I think we should be less concerned about where the Jamaican dollar is. Because the Jamaican dollar will find its own level based upon the productivity that we, the people in Jamaica, produce. And the Jamaican dollar, essentially, is a balancing factor to productivity. And it's very dangerous to believe that success looks like having a stable Jamaican dollar. What is important is that we understand and we manage expectations of where it ought to be. Because if we believe wrongly that having a Jamaican dollar stuck at one rate or stable is what success looks like, we're really going to understand what failure looks like. Because in two years' time, we're going to wake up and all the work, the hard work that's been put in to developing BPO spaces and export-led industries is going to go to waste. Because if you asked Jampro today, Jampro said, yes, there's lots of people wanting to come to Jamaica to build BPO. And it's true. There are. And we need to embrace that because that's going to create jobs. And jobs will create expenditure in the economy, which is going to develop the economy. And we will all grow. But that's today. In six months' time, if we maintain a dollar at the wrong rate for whatever reason, I can guarantee you if there were 10 people lined up today, there'll be five. And then in 12 months, there might be two. In 18 months, we're going to be questioning, why is there no one wanting to go into BPO? We've built all this space. And the reason is because suddenly we found out that we've woken up and Jamaica costs a lot more money to do business in than another alternative substitute market. Because unless we in Jamaica improve our productivity, we are not going to see an improvement in the performance of our currency. And that is just an absolute reality. And that is what we need to understand. And improving our productivity requires significant changes. Changes to labor laws, investment in education to produce people who can pr produce products. And it's, it's really a longer term strategy, but has to happen. So it's very, very important that we don't get distracted by what is important to measure and it's very, very important that we focus and concentrate on inflation. Because as Jane and B could tell you, because they're in the bond business, what's important to people who hold bonds is inflation. What's important to external, invest external investors who could hold bonds is inflation. And you've got to have a credible inflation policy. I think it's less important where the dollar is, we've got to focus on inflation. We need the right narrative. The dollar is going to move regardless of what we want to do. Because to a large degree, what happens externally and currencies trade in pairs, etc., uh, is out of our control. So for all the businesses that exist in Jamaica, all of us, we have to be very focused on what's happening outside of Jamaica. Whether it is the British leaving Brexit, or leaving Europe and Brexiting, or the oil prices, the crises in Venezuela, or the change in the US administration, which could have possible trade implications with regard to all of our agreements, etc., or double taxation, or climate control, etc., seems to be a lot of different things that are being questioned and re-looked at. 
All of those things can affect us in Jamaica. And we're very fortunate to have to hear today our foreign minister who is more than capable and extremely competent in dealing with all these matters. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing what she has to say on those issues. I thank the keynote speaker for coming. Thank you very much. Um, the topic that you have today is incredibly relevant to Jamaica. Um, we are an island and we're very vulnerable to external shocks. We have made improvements. We have worked very hard over the last five years to diversify our reliance on oil. We will have a gas-fired generated electricity in the next 18 months. That will make a huge difference to Jamaica, a massive difference to Jamaica. Because Jamaica's economic growth, if you look at it, almost correlates to the oil price. The 1970s, with the high oil prices and the oil crisis, we had negative economic growth. Our recent poor performance also relates to the oil price. The recent drop in the oil price is what has given us some oxygen. And now we're suddenly seeing 1%, 2% growth. And we have an excellent opportunity to capitalize that, capitalize on that. So it's a very exciting time for all of us in Jamaica right now as growth is a real possibility due to the fiscal discipline that the government has continued and I hope will continue, as well as a gift in the lower oil prices helping, helping us tremendously. That being said though, we're still vulnerable to external shocks, whether they're shocks from God in the form of bad weather or hurricanes or the shocks that exist in the Middle East or elsewhere. And as a result, we have to be super sensitive to that. So I don't want to keep you from the great speakers that are ahead of you and the wonderful day that you have. I'd like to just thank you very much for coming and attending. And I, like you, am eager to, to hear what, what is to be said. So thank you and welcome. Thank you, President. Um, our next speaker, Senator the Honorable Kamina Johnson-Smith, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade is really from the private sector, which is why I think she's so effective. <laughs> right, 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 Minister? <laughs> um, but there, there was no, it, it wasn't by coincidence that, that this, the minister was chosen, because when we were planning the, the um, event and we looked at what are the things that's going to be important for us going forward, we recognized that it's not just about what's happening internally, but the, the the relationships and the negotiations that take place are going to have some serious impact for us and therefore what better person to address us today than the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. So without further ado, I'll invite the Minister to address us. Mr. President Paul Scott, Vice President of the PSOJ, Dennis Chung, CEO, Executive Members of the PSOJ, Members of the JMNB family, Sponsors, our guest speaker, Mr. Sri Ras Ramaswamy. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the media, good morning. It's my pleasure to join you this morning to bring greetings at this year 11th staging of the PSOJ GMMB Annual Economic Forum. The private sector is undoubtedly the engine of the economic growth that we are seeking to achieve as a country. And not only in the remaining four years of our five in four growth agenda target, but certainly beyond. This is a core principle of this administration. I therefore want to commend the organizers of this forum for the commitment that you have consistently demonstrated to the economic development of Jamaica, bringing together agents of production and industry to have important discussions about relevant current issues. And of course, also for doing the actual manufacturing, producing, marketing, managing, the actual economic activity that is required to create a better quality of life for the Jamaican people and of course for our economy. I'm pleased to note the broad stakeholder participation in the forum as well, 
that sets the stage for inclusive engagement, introspection, and the identification of solutions to mitigate current and emerging challenges to economic growth and development. At the domestic level, we're working hard to maintain economic stability and to facilitate growth, meeting targets set under the current IMF arrangement, improving our standing on the ease of doing business index, and boosting both investor and consumer confidence. Your theme this year, as was stated earlier, is a most timely and critical one, because if there is one thing which is certain now, it is that our international environment is uncertain. The global financial and economic crises that emerged in 2008 still have lingering effects on the ability of many countries worldwide to navigate the international economic arena. This has produced a level of unpredictability in the global economic system that further complicates an already complex environment for trade in goods and services. In addition, the international political context in which all of this takes place has become prone to its own unpredictability and in some cases, instability. The 2017 World Economic Outlook projects a global economic growth rate of 3.5% in 2017, with a marginal increase in 2018 to 3.6%. And while this growth is not being viewed as impressive, it still has the potential to propel our economy if we're able to take advantage of the opportunities provided by the bilateral, regional, and multilateral arrangements entered into by Jamaica. In this regard, our active participation in the creation and maintenance of a multilateral rules-based trading system, which will facilitate greater stability and predictability, is essential to ensuring that Jamaican companies are not disadvantaged due to increasing trends in unilateralism. We have observed, among other things, the increasing trend in some of our biggest trading partners to resort to protectionism, to retreat from regional blocks which put small island developing states such as Jamaica at a disadvantage. The UK's imminent withdrawal from the EU, Brexit, as alluded to earlier, is of course a case in point. This will not only have macroeconomic consequences for European economies, but will have an impact on the Caribbean region. We're working to minimize this impact, at least in respect of the terms on which we trade with the UK, and you'll be happy to know that that work is actually going quite well. The withdrawal of correspondent banking relations as part of the de-risking measures of major international banks is also great cause for concern. Such financial exclusion, as you're aware, threatens the survival of all economic undertakings, both public and private sector based. It's therefore an issue which we raise in all international fora as a point of advocacy or for action as relevant. And it's my hope that this issue will be discussed this morning as well. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2030 Agenda, a critical multilateral framework designed to guide states in the pursuit of 17 sustainable development goals, speaks to the eradication of poverty, social inclusiveness, environmental protection, as well as decent jobs and economic growth. It's broadly been recognized, however, that without all stakeholders involved globally, governments, private sector, and NGOs working together in partnership, the SDGs will not be attainable. So how will our business practices fit in with or adjust to this new paradigm? Will we and can we? Already we're observing a more environmentally friendly approach to consumption patterns worldwide with more countries seeking to ban plastic, for example, and to adopt and promptly ratify the Paris Agreement on climate change. And yes, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So one country might pull out, and it energizes other countries to get more involved. And that is what we're actually seeing on the international scene. Under that agreement, under the Paris Agreement, and at the particular urging of small island developing states, state parties have committed to limit global warming to less than two degrees above pre-industrial levels. How will this impact production of goods and services by Jamaican companies? With the impact of internet and cable, how far out can we anticipate a broadening of the number of discerning customers who will start to question how we produce and how we package? How will we respond to the demand for an increased provision of meaningful jobs that will reduce, or better yet, eliminate environmental hazards while lifting people out of vulnerability to poverty? In a relatively short space of time, I'm sure you'll all agree, corporate social responsibility has certainly grown in strength and popularity. 
So how long will it take for the three pillars of sustainability to be embedded in business planning locally? That is the environmental, social, and economic elements of planning. How broadly will sustainable use of resources start to sit beside profit motive? And how much of a role will these principles start to play in competitiveness locally and globally? These are questions for which we must jointly find answers and solutions. Uh, Mr. Ramaswamy? <laughs> it certainly cannot be business as usual as we all face the reality of preserving the country and planet in which we live, work, do business, and raise families. Ladies and gentlemen, I couldn't close without mentioning the Jamaica 55 Diaspora Conference being convened by my ministry here in Kingston in the coming days. As we consider global environments, I wish to remind of the significant potential for the diaspora to continue building a powerful Jamaican brand overseas. The marketplace at the conference center will provide an excellent opportunity for companies to introduce or re-establish their goods and services in a captive or to a captive audience of overseas Jamaicans. Connections made during the conference days can and should have far-reaching impacts on the capacity of companies to secure a niche in the vast markets of many of the adopted homelands of our diasporians. It is my hope that many companies represented here have already secured their space in the marketplace. If you haven't, it's too late. But I hope that you'll still pass through. <laughs> We're full up, fully booked, but you can still register for a day, come through, meet people, make connections, start the conversation. The foundation, ladies and gentlemen, has been laid for the acceleration of private sector initiatives. Acknowledging the fact that our economic growth and development project still has a long way to go, I look forward to the results of your deliberations. I remain confident that Jamaica's best days are still ahead and that you, or private sector partners, have a critical role to play in identifying how Jamaican companies can surmount current global economic trends, not only for your survival, sustainability, growth, and profitability, but for the building of a better Jamaica. Together, we can ensure that no one is left behind. I thank you, and I wish you a fantastic morning. So we're going to ask Ms. Janelle Atkinson, research officer at PSOJ, to say grace, and then we're going to breakfast. Good morning, everyone. Please bow your heads for prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy high and holy name. Lord, we pause at this moment to say thank you for the food which you have provided us with. Lord, we're very grateful because we know even at this point that there are many which are without. Lord, as we reflect upon these blessings which you grant unto us each day, may we acknowledge you as our provider and our sustainer. Lord, we ask at this moment that you will please forgive us where we have sinned and please renew the right spirit within us. Lord, these and other unmentioned mercies we ask through your son's name I pray. Amen. Sri Ramaswamy is a partner at the McKinsey Global Institute. McKinsey's business and economics research arm. He leads research on the economics of digitization and economics of multinational corporations. Additionally, he is responsible for shaping MGI's research initiatives, leading research on trends in competition, technology, and global forces influencing multinationals. Three is also a co-leader of MGI's research on North America and has authored reports and articles on the ongoing digital transformation of the US economy, on new investment opportunities, on opportunities and challenges of the NAFTA region, and the role of US multinational firms in the global economy. Sri's work is frequently cited in such notable publications as The Economist, The Financial Times, The Harvard Business Review, and Wall Street Journal, among other publications. Prior to joining McKinsey, Sri spent a decade in the US telecom and aerospace sector. He has worked in regulatory affairs and engineering research for broadband satellite networks and holds three patents. He is the holder of an MBA, master's, and bachelor's degrees in engineering and telecommunications. 
I would like you to join me in welcoming Sri as he speaks on the topic of global expectations and changes in policy. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me back there? All right. Um, thank you for the introduction, and uh, thank you, Dennis and Paul, for inviting my, uh, me over, and for, to the minister for her comments as well. Um, this is my second trip to Kingston. I was here last year. Some of you may remember, um, they may have been part of that, that discussion as well. Um, I was very happy back then to be invited to Kingston because uh, this was in October, I think, of last year, and there was a big presidential election going on in my hometown of Washington, D.C., and I was looking for a place to hide to get away from all the noise and chaos. Um, I'm back now. The election is over. Um, I am still looking for a place to hide from all the noise and chaos. So thank you for inviting me back again. I, um, I want to pick up on some of the themes that, that some of the speakers have already mentioned. Uh, you know, this point about collaboration that the minister talked about, uh, you know, of, of, of figuring out how you uh, change Jamaica's engagement both with the external world and internally as well. Uh, and going back to some of the points that, that Dennis made and that Paul made around productivity uh, and sort of the need to focus on those sorts of issues. Um, so let me first start by just giving you a sense of um, what is going on in the global economy? And you know, especially over the last year or so, we've seen you know, with Brexit and with the US election and with some of the things going on in Europe, um, there are some big shifts going on. And uh, you know, I would love to be able to sit here and tell you about the specific policies that are changing, but the reality is nobody knows. And if somebody thinks they know, they are either lying to you or they're lying to themselves. Um, nobody actually knows what is going to happen, um, but what I thought I would do then is give you some sense for um, why there seems to be a need for change. So that even if these specific policies are not being articulated, whether it's on trade or tax or whatever else, at least we know what's driving the change, right? And then we will know that, you know, whatever happens in the specific policies, you kind of know what's driving it and you kind of keep, keep your eye on that, on that ball in the long run. And so that's really what I'm hoping we can do here. So um, I also want to see if we can give enough time at the end. You know, I, I don't want to drone on for an hour and, and bore everybody. So I'm going to see if we can leave enough time at the end for some Q&A, because I know there will be some questions about, about what's going on in, in some of these other countries. So um, I, want, I would invite you to step back, step back from your day-to-day, -day, step back from your organizations, step back from Jamaica. and. Let's think a little bit about how the global economy has changed. And to do this, I'm going to use a concept called the economic center of gravity, which is exactly what you think it means. It is, where is the world's economic center? And I'm going to show you how this has changed over time. We will go back 2,000 years, because when you go back before 2,000 years, the data gets a little bit unreliable. We <laughs> said, all right, we'll start 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, with the Indian subcontinent, with all these kingdoms, the Han Dynasty off in China, the Roman Empire out to the West uh, in, in Europe, the economic center of gravity was where South Asia meets Central Asia. Okay? It stayed there for 1,500 years. And then it started to move. It started to move with the European travelers. It then started to accelerate with the first industrial revolution and then the second industrial revolution, and then all the technological changes that came after that. So that by 1950, the world's economic center of gravity was in the North Atlantic. It is not in Greenland, it is in the North Atlantic, right? You have to think in three dimensions. You kind of think of North America pulling the center of gravity over the pole and Europe pulling it westward. And it stayed there. And then it started to move. So that by 1980, it was heading back towards Asia, and since then, it has accelerated. So that over the next 10 years, the economic center of gravity will be right back where it began. And I want you to keep this in mind, because it took 500 years for that center of gravity to move to the North Atlantic, and it took 75 years to come back. Okay? So many of the things that I'm going to talk about, many of these policy changes, these uncertainties that you see in the global economy, this is what's driving it. 
Now, for the longest time, that expansion was considered to be all positive news for everybody, right? There were millions of workers joining the labor force. There was all these companies seeing new markets opening up, massive opportunities from technology uh, to improve productivity, to make new investments, huge benefits for all of us as consumers, right? We have people living longer, living healthier, uh, more opportunities for our children. All of that was true. Now we're seeing that it was true with some caveats. So where are we today? All right. This is what drives economic growth. There are three cycles to it. There are workers who uh, make income. Right? They spend that income on new products and services, which generates consumption. That triggers investment by companies to respond to that. Those investments result in new technologies, new equipment coming in, production expansions, which improves productivity, raises employment opportunities, more jobs for workers, more incomes for workers, and we go right back to the cycle that begins again. I'm not sure if that works. So in that context, if you look at what has happened to the economic outlook, this is a survey that we do of global executives every, every quarter. And there are two ways to look at this chart. One is to focus just on the greens. And we say, OK, in the past six months or so, the sentiment is turning positive. Right? Globally, executives are thinking, you know what, things actually might be starting to improve compared to last year. Now, last year was particularly uncertain, given all the election fever, the referendums, uh, not just Brexit in the US, but people were thinking about, you know, what are the Dutch going to do? What are the French going to do? What are the Germans going to do? Uh, and there were all these kinds of issues around um, political instability, terrorism. Uh, those are all things that, that weighed on people's minds. So that's one way to look at it. The sentiment is sort of turning positive. Um, I am quite popular at McKinsey for my glass half empty approach. Um, so I will point out the glass half empty, which is that you still have 50 to 60% of respondents saying things are either going to stay the same or they're going to get worse. Right? And so that really hasn't changed. And I want you to keep that number in mind, that 55, 60% that you see between the, the yellow and the red. Uh, and you'll see later on a number that is surprisingly consistent with that number. So the big issue that executives are talking about is geopolitical uncertainty. Okay? Note here how some of the other risks are not considered as important. The slowdown in China, the volatility, the issue with inflation. People aren't as worried about that as much as they are with what is going on in the political domain and what is happening in geopolitics. So what is going on? Well, what, that, what is going on there is reflective of what is happening among individuals and households. And so this is a chart that shows you a trust barometer that was surveyed um, primarily in advanced economies, primarily in the US and in North America and Europe. And that 55% number that I, that I just talked about, right? executives saying they're not, as con they're not as confident, that is reflective of a 53% of individuals saying this system is not working. So as much as you had this big shift in the center of gravity and we all loved it and people like me in cities like Washington DC went around saying, this is great, right? The world is flat, you know, everybody's one big family. It turns out we're actually not, right? More than half of the people surveyed said this is not working. And as a result of that sentiment, we are losing trust in the institutions that have kept us going for a long time. Right? And so this is, you can see, 37% believing that CEOs are credible, even less than that believing that politicians are credible. In some countries like the US, this is much worse. There is a video out on Facebook by, I think it was Arnold Schwarzenegger, who talks about how the trust rating in the US Congress is now less than a whole number of other things, including various diseases. So I want to talk a little bit about why this is happening and what the implications are. And the reason I bring this up is because this is not a fleeting moment in time. This is how things are going to be 
unless something changes structurally. So what are these structural issues? So on the surface, they are not evident, right? So this is a US picture. I'm going to use the US as an example for some of these things. But where applicable, I'm going to call out some of the other countries as well. Uh, and, and what I'd like you to keep in mind is, as you consider Jamaica's engagement with the global economy, as you consider Jamaica's engagement with these countries, what should change in the way you approach that engagement? Right? How should you anticipate certain types of movements? And how should you try to understand what those countries are dealing with? And how does that change the proposition uh, or the engagement that you have with them? So this is a chart of the US labor market. The, the orange line shows you the unemployment rate. And it shows you that on the surface, things actually look pretty good, right? We are back below 5%. We are at 4.4 or 4.5% unemployment rate, which is pretty good. Um, the blue bars show you the, uh, the monthly jobs that have been created. And you can see that we are coming off of about 75, 76 months of continuous job creation. It is the longest job creation streak in US history. OK? So it looks fantastic, right? Wrong. Ultimately, jobs are not just for jobs, right? They are for incomes. And so what we need to focus on is what is happening to incomes. So the chart on the left shows you what has happened to incomes over the last decade. This is market income, which is basically your wages and salaries and any income that you get from interest. And you can see that uh, over the last decade, about 80% or so of US families were in income segments where the income declined in the last 10 years, despite the fact that the labor market recovered the way it did. Right? It's not just a US story. You can see many countries out there that had a similar trend. If you notice, by the way, these countries, Italy, US, the UK, the Dutch, these are all countries that had a transition of political leadership in the last 18 months. Right? Some of them unplanned. Most of them unexpected. Now, in the US, that change in market income, that pressure on households was relieved by government action. And so you can see the chart on the right saying, OK, after government taxes and transfers were taken into account, the blow to households was cushioned. Right? That has come at a significant cost, public cost. And what you see playing out in the political dynamic is a reflection of that. Right? So the pressure on the public budgets, the pressure on the sector is all part of this. Now, as tough as it was for incomes, what you're also finding is that the incomes are not being distributed properly. Right? So again, you'll see this chart for the US. The same trend is playing out across a bunch of advanced economies. Um, some households are doing really well. Most households are not. And this is the geographic version of it. Okay, so this is a chart that shows you how incomes have changed by county in the US, there's 3,000 odd counties um, in the last five years during the recovery. And you find that uh, you know, the, the overall national income growth is only about 1%, which is quite, quite anemic. Uh, and a bunch of counties in the US managed to even underperform that. Right? And many of them are actually negative. You see a similar trend in the UK. Uh, it is a little bit more muted in some of the places that kind of went to the brink and then danced back, like the Netherlands and France. So why does this matter? It, it matters because as you think about that big shift in the global economy and you think about all these workers joining the labor force, it used to be in the advanced economies that workers could move to the most promising opportunities. This is what's happened to the US mobility rate, that is the, the rate of, at which workers move from one place to the other in search of opportunities. Right? It has dropped in half in the last 25 years. And there's a bunch of economic theories out there about why this is happening. Some people think it's because of an aging population. Older people don't move as much. Some people think it's dual income families. Right? It's harder for two people to move. Some people think it's because of the home ownership issue. Um, there's a bunch of new research that is suggesting that it's actually on the demand side. There's not as many companies that are starting up in, in these advanced economies. The ones that are starting up are not able to grow. And so as a worker, if you don't see companies hiring, you're not going to move. And so that may be what's driving some of this as well. But essentially what it means is that you're basically locked into place. right? 
And it is very interesting to compare these economic prospects to the political charts to see how people are voting. I'm often asked in DC, you know, um, I was especially asked right after the election in, in November, um, are we living in a bubble, right? And my response to that is, is, is no, we're not in a bubble. But there are two economies in this country, just as there are two economies in most countries, right? So in that sense, the advanced economies are becoming a little bit like developing economies, right? Where there is a bifurcation of prospects uh, and it's getting much harder to move from one piece to the other. Right? I mean, I spent half my life in India growing up um, and, and working there, and many of the trends that you see in the US are reflective of what India was going through back then, and is still going through. Right? And so these sorts of regional disparities, these sort of disparities in income, um, they're reflected in many different forms of, of, of the household engagement. So you see, for instance, and this is getting worse over time. So as you saw that big economic center of gravity shifting, especially the acceleration post the 1980s, that coincides with the acceleration in the way um, economic recoveries are getting concentrated geographically. So every time we have a recession in places like in some of the European countries or in North America, every time we have a recession and a recovery, the recession is broad-based and the recovery is concentrated in terms of households, in terms of companies, and in terms of regions. Right? And this has been, like I said, growing over time which is why my point that this is not some fleeting moment in time, this is a long-term structural trend that many of these policymakers are now finally, um, you know, I guess this is sort of democracy in action, right? You kind of, you know, a spotlight is, is, is now shining where it should have been shining. Um, and so I'm hopeful in that sense, at least, that, we, that we'll start to see some changes. So, so what is going on? Okay, so what are some of the responses coming out? Certainly, there's kind of this broad push around deregulation, uh, both in the UK and in the US, right? There's the general sense that we need to kind of break this logjam. Um, I'm not sure why this phone is whistling at me, um, or, or, or whose phone it is. Um, there's a sense that we have to break this logjam, right? That you have to get companies to become more dynamic. We have to kind of reduce the regulatory burdens on companies, and the regulatory burdens um, take many forms. There's financial burdens because, you know, post-financial crisis, there were some significant regulatory burdens imposed. There are environmental constraints. Um, and so there are, you know, and there are tax constraints, right? So if you think about some of the policy proposals coming out from the U.S. administration, um, that's basically what they're kind of focusing on, is can we try to remove, reduce the regulatory burden? Um, and as we do that, can we also try to sort of change the playing field a little bit. So the risk with these sorts of issues always is the fact that you, you end up looking for scapegoats, right? So when you have these sorts of issues where half the households are not doing really well, uh, companies are not starting up, income prospects are, you know, very widely, the instinctive reaction is, who do I blame? Whose fault is this, right? And so you see that playing out in some of the big debates you know, in the US, so it's Mexico's fault, it's China's fault, it's India's fault, it's Germany's fault. Um, not all of that is true, not all of it is helpful, but basically what the administration is trying to do is change things on trade policy. Okay, there's a general sense that the US is not benefiting from its trade agreements or from its engagement with the world. Um, and that some parts of the U.S. have benefited, but the vast majority have not, okay? And so there's three things that, that, the, uh, that the administration is considering broadly. One is around a, a general import tariff, right? We're basically saying U.S. producers are getting hammered. Uh, there's a bunch of low-cost imports coming in. It is not fair. Uh, those companies, those producers are using unfair practices. We'll impose a tariff, okay? Or we will, as part of that, we will either dissolve or renegotiate existing trade agreements. Uh, and those are things that can be done, right? So there's, you know, there's temporary tariffs that can be imposed. Um, at some point, the US Congress has to step in to say, this is temporary. Do we make it permanent or not? Um, and we don't know what shape that will take, right? And so that's my point about you know, the specifics on the policy. Nobody really knows how this is going to play out or when it's going to play out. But that's 
the point about the point about sort of the unfair nature of a global engagement that is not benefiting the, the majority of US workers is what is driving this notion of an import tariff. The second one is around uh, corporate taxes. And this is really about um, easing the burden. Okay, and so the idea was that, so the US corporate tax rate is among the highest in the OECD. It's among the highest in the, in the world, in fact, at about 39%. That is the statutory tax rate. Uh, very few companies actually pay that. And the effective tax rate is closer to about 20%, right? So for the largest firms, I don't know that this will make a big difference, but it will make a difference to the smaller companies that tend not to have these global arrangements to, to change things on tax. Uh, and then the third piece is around the most interesting aspect of this, which is um, trying to move to a value-added tax system the way a lot of other countries have, except it's not going to be value-added, it's going to be based on sales, right? And the idea is that, you know, we wanted, the administration is trying to make it such that it's easier to produce in the U.S. and export out and change the dynamic where currently the impression is it's easier to produce outside the U.S. and import into the U.S. And there's a range of factors about why that may be happening, uh, but that's really what they're trying to change, right? So essentially all of this is to, is to try to say, yes, 70% of the U.S. economy is consumption, but can we do something to support production? Can we do something to support the companies and the industries that are trying to make things in the US, right? Um, and so that's what's driving, you know, whether it's make America great again, whether it's America first, whatever it is, right? That's, what, that's what's driving this, that's the sentiment. Um, in the UK, things are a little bit different. Okay, so in the UK, there is not a backlash as much on trade it is much more of an immigration story in the UK, right? And there's a sense that, um, you know, again, it's hard to distinguish between, you know, what is scapegoating versus what's actually real issues, right? But, you know, there's a very general sense in the UK that, you know, this is not about protectionism, this is about renegotiating trade. And in fact, the same thing is true about the US as well. You know, people often kind of say the US is becoming more protectionist. And the counter argument that the administration will make is that it's not becoming protectionist, it's kind of trying to move to fair trade, whatever that means. Right? But the idea is that we want to renegotiate the trade agreements. There's a general sense that we want to stay engaged, but we want to renegotiate things so that there's more domestic production. And this is why. Okay? So if you look at advanced industries, advanced manufacturing industries, the trade deficit in the US has, the orange line, has collapsed right, in the last 20, 25 years. And um, this is a matter of concern. The only other advanced economy that has this trend, no surprises, is the UK, right? So you see this, this, this economic dynamic is again something that explains to me a great deal of what has happened in these two countries in the last 18 months or so. A sense that globally engaging with the world is not helping, right? It is somehow, the economic theory will tell you that an advanced economy should be doing really well in these industries, right? It's one thing to lose your shoe manufacturing to China, but it's a different thing to have a trade deficit even in automobiles. Like, that doesn't make any sense, right? So that's one thing that's driving it. This obviously has a huge impact. This is the chart that shows you what has happened to the US manufacturing workforce, right? And you can see that um, it stayed around 17 million, 18 million workers for the longest time, and it collapsed in the last decade. Right, we lost one third of manufacturing jobs. Um, it's not particularly helpful that the collapse began in the year 2000, around the time that China joined the World Trade Organization, which is why the big China bashing thing that goes on. But in reality, there's many, many factors that have been driving this. And in fact, the decline has actually started in the mid 90s uh, in different industries for different reasons. And it's not just the jobs, this goes back to my point about incomes, right? So as we think about jobs, uh, as we think about the prospects in these advanced economies and how um, the policies might be changing, at its heart is what is happening to incomes. And so this is a chart that shows you what's happening to workers in a bunch of industries. And you see that in, in many of these large, traditional, labor-intensive, asset-heavy industries like retail and transport and construction and manufacturing, 
workers are not doing well, and they have not been doing well for a long time. Okay, so this is the, uh, you'll see again the same trend in, in fact, many advanced economies. Now, some advanced economies, like the Germans and the Koreans, have taken exports as a way out of this situation, right? Um, other advanced economies, like the US and the UK, have been at the receiving end of that action, which in turn is what's driving some of the backlash against the exporting countries. So, um, why is this happening? Right? Now, why this is, now uh, while this is happening, what you see in the corporate sector is another kind of interesting sector, uh, story. So you would expect that if workers are seeing this kind of a trend, a pressure on wages, you would expect that corporations will benefit from it. Right? And again, at the high level, what you find is that US corporate profits are at record highs. Right? UK's corporate profits are at record highs. And that is fueling this narrative that these fat corporations are greedy and they're squeezing workers and, and that's how things are changing. What's really happening is something that's a little bit more nuanced. The line chart shows you the median return on capital for US corporations. In this case, you'll see a similar trend for most European firms. The numbers at the bottom show you the average return on capital. And both the median and the average have been rising right, over time. And you can see the acceleration, especially since the 80s and the 90s and post 2000. The bar chart shows you the variance, which is the standard deviation to the mean, and that has almost doubled. And to me, that is the most interesting aspect. What that tells you is that there are a few corporations that are pulling away from the pack, right? And so your average has become a misleading number, just like your average income growth is misleading. Your average GDP growth is misleading. Because if you have a country where you've got two different economies functioning, your average number doesn't mean anything anymore, right? So you have to keep that in mind. And so we have a situation unfolding where, as you think about those big global shifts going on, some parts of the economies have figured out how to adapt. And when I say some parts, I mean some companies, some workers, some regions. And large parts of the economy, large companies, small firms, many industries, their workers are struggling. And so if you look at the US economy for now, for instance, many of those industries where you saw workers with wage pressures, there are 30% to 40% fewer companies in those industries, right? Because those companies have died. So a lot of that regulatory burden, a lot of the stuff that you're seeing on, on tax and trade is a reaction to that is to say, we cannot continue this path. We have to figure out some way to change this around. Now, the economics um, are hotly debated. Nobody actually knows what's going on. Um, there's many, many theories out there. Some people say, well, the reason incomes are, are low is because the unemployment rate may be four, four and a half percent, very low. But there's a lot of people who are not in the labor force, right? When they come back in, um, as they come back in, you know, they sort of keeping pressure, uh, downward pressure on, on incomes. Um, there's another theory, which is what I just talked about here, which is that as you have these big global shifts, you're seeing a few companies and workers benefiting from it, right? And that's leading to what's called a superstar effect. This is particularly true in the technology sector. So as economies are becoming more digitized, you're seeing um, you know, the Googles and the Facebooks and the Apples of the world you know, really seeing massive income growth. And if you are a worker in those companies, you're actually doing really well, right? Um, but if you are a worker in an industry that is getting disrupted by technology, then you're not doing all that well. But you know what, in that case, the company you work for is also not doing all that well, right? Um, and to Paul's point about the inflation, right, the issue that advanced economies are facing, this is my last bullet point here, is that we actually might be having too little inflation, right? And there's a sense that, you know, we're, we're not seeing enough price growth if you don't have enough price growth, then people are not going to expect their incomes to rise, which means they're going to put off buying cars and houses, which reduces the demand, which means companies are not going to make investments. Right? And so you kind of see that cycle taking hold of, okay, nobody's investing, nobody's raising prices, workers aren't improving their conditions. Uh, and so this, all of these theories are, are sort of out there. So let me 
close with just a, just a few points on what we think needs to happen. And I'm going to try to link this back to some of the stuff that Paul said. And I think this has implications not just for, adv for advanced economies, but even for the Jamaican economy. And that is, what do you need to have an economy that is healthy and vibrant in this kind of a global context of massive change and unequal distribution of, of income? So the first thing to keep in mind, I'm going to bring this back to the point about productivity. Um, productivity, unfortunately, is a very esoteric concept, right? It's this kind of weird economic indicator that doesn't really, it's hard to tell what it means. But at its very basis, it is the amount of wealth that is created for every worker, right? Um, now, the reason I bring this up is because as you think about the next 50 years, right, both in the global economy and in the Jamaican context, we will be facing a problem of aging. Um, so will the Caribbean region, so will Jamaica. And the problem with aging is that people retire and they leave the workforce. If you look at what has happened in the last 50 years, the 3.5, 3.6% GDP growth that the World Economic Outlook um, says, um, they have been tracking this for the last 50 years and they said it's been 3.5, 3.6%. Half of it was driven by employment growth people joining the labor force, half of it by productivity. So if people retire and leave, employment falls. And if productivity growth does not compensate, you end up with less overall growth. OK? So we need productivity growth to accelerate. It has been slowing down. So. As much as the political debate and the policy changes are around trade and immigration, this is what keeps economists up at night. Why is productivity slowing when it's supposed to accelerate, when it needs to accelerate? And how do we turn this around? Right, so this is kind of showing you what has happened to the annual growth rate of productivity. Um, this, is in, this is across all advanced economies. And you can see that you, know, you, need, to, you need to get going at about 2.1, 2.3%. We are now at 0.7%. Last year, US productivity growth turned negative for the first time in 35 years. Okay. And this goes back to my chart about why this matters. Because if you don't have that productivity at the far end of that chart, um, you don't see incomes increasing for workers. Because at the end of the day, productivity is what creates wealth and that wealth is shared with workers in a properly functioning economy, and then that kind of triggers the cycle. So here's what we have been running around advocating. Much as the, these big disruptions are taking hold, whether it's in globalization or technology or anything else, um, you've got these economies essentially kind of reacting to it, and the reaction is to put up a wall, right? Let's try to slow this down. Let's try to push back. We have sort of an opposite view of this. Right? And what we are seeing is that, yes, you've got these big global forces, but the entire economy is not engaging. And this is, by the way, extremely relevant for Jamaica as well. So when you think about the role of technology and how technology is diffusing through companies, most companies have not figured out how to use technology. Most companies are not seeing efficiency gains from technology because they haven't figured out how to use it. If you think about globalization, most companies are not global. A few are, right? The vast majority of companies don't participate. In places like Jamaica, you have the additional problem of informality, which also means that companies don't participate, right? So the US, for instance, has been yelling about how it is being unfairly treated in global trade. The reality is that less than 1% of US companies participate in exports. Of that 1%, two-thirds export to one country. Most of that time, that country is Canada, which doesn't really count, really. <laughs> right? Well, Canada, no, Canada does count. But if you're a US company exporting to Canada, that doesn't really count as, being, as an export. Um, Canada counts very much, especially nowadays. <laughs> um, so you know, the point being here that what, what we think needs to happen is rather than pull back and build, a, and build walls and try to slow the transition, what we're pushing for is you actually need to move forward. You need to get more engagement, get more firms, more workers, more households participating in these transitions. But to do that, 
you have to do what I call greasing the supply side, right? Which is a wonderful term, as I can see from the reaction in this room. Um, I do need to find another term for this. But greasing the supply side means, you know, if you, as, a, as an economy, if you are getting your firms and your workers to engage more in the global economy, to become more digitized, there will be dislocations, and the dislocations will accelerate. But you need to counter that, and the way you counter that is by ensuring that your workers are able to move quickly from one opportunity to another, right? That your capital is able to move quickly, right? That things like infrastructure and housing, and I'm not talking about low-income housing for poor people. I mean, as critical as that is, I'm talking about housing for middle-income workers. Can you get workers to move to where the opportunities are? Can you get companies to move? Right? Can we become more productive in the way we use the inputs, the materials, the energy? Right? This is what we're advocating for. That rather than kind of pulling back and saying, all right, you know what, this isn't really working for me, you kind of need to engage. And as you engage, you need to build these strengths. You need to make these sorts of investments to say, can I actually invest in a workforce? Can I actually invest in, in housing and infrastructure? So let me close with just a couple of thoughts on one or two of these points, okay? When I say you need to invest in a workforce, the question I normally get is, well, there's all this technology changing the workforce, tell me what I should train my workers for. And that's a problem. Asking that question and answering it is a problem. Because it used to be that you could, you know, you could look at the demand and you could say, I need more civil engineers and I'm gonna train a bunch of civil engineers and guess what, it's out there, right? But the problem now is that you have technology disruption going on so quickly that by the time you train workers to the old pathways, their skills are obsolete when they come out, right? Three or four years ago, um, we at McKinsey published a report on data scientists and we said, you know, we need, I forget the number was, maybe a million and a half data scientists or something like that, right? Two months ago, we published a report on artificial intelligence and one of the things we said was that if you look at the new machine learning technologies, one of the things they do really well is data science. So what happens to all those data scientists if you've got machine learning algorithms that can do better data science than the data scientists, right? This, by the way, is something that seems to be accelerating. So this is a chart that shows you the share of jobs. These are middle skill jobs, but they apply. So middle skill jobs are you know, manufacturing or, or transportation jobs. Uh, but this applies just as well to other types of jobs. Um, this is the share of middle skill jobs that have been displaced by technology. And when I say displaced, it means that something has changed in the nature of these jobs. It doesn't mean the jobs have gone away, but it means the tasks that workers perform has changed, the tools they use have changed, the skills they need have changed. And you can see that given the current trends of technology disruption, this is going to accelerate. So the question as you reinvest in your workforce to build a more dynamic economy that can allow more people to participate the question is not, what do I train my workers for? The question is, how do I train my workers when I don't know what to train them for? <laughs> right? Ten years from now, the economic history will tell you that with all the technology disruption, there will be new jobs. We just don't know what those jobs will be. The pace of change today tells you that that is going to substantially accelerate. So how do you create a labor market that is nimble and quick in responding to changes? How do you take construction workers and make them manufacturing workers? How do you take retail workers and make them healthcare workers? How do we do that? We don't have a system, right? And so these are the kinds of things that we are advocating for. As um, you look forward, this is a chart that shows you what is happening with automation. All right, so what we did was to look at the automation potential for different types of workers, right? So you think about, Automation, people think of robots versus jobs, right? It's not really robots versus jobs. It is robots versus tasks. We all have jobs, and in our jobs, we perform many tasks. Some of those tasks are useful, hopefully. Um, many are better done by robots or machines or algorithms or software, right? So what we looked at is what share of the tasks can be done by machines, and that's the bar chart that you see on the far right. What you'll see is that many of the workers who have seen wage pressures over the last 30, 35 years, those workers in transport and retail, are all at the top of this list. 
Okay? This goes back to my point that what we're seeing is not a fleeting moment in time. This is a structural change. It is here to stay. And so the question for you folks is not what is this administration in Washington, D.C. going to do? The question is, regardless of what this particular administration is going to do, what will the next administration do? Because these issues are not going to go away. So let me close by making a pitch. This is the pitch that we've been making in the US as well, saying, look, when you actually put these different things together, those five things that I talked about for the US, right? Engaging more in the global economy, becoming more technology oriented, making that broad based, and at the same time, greasing the supply side to make sure that your economy is rapidly responding to the dislocation, you actually can restore some pretty significant growth in the US and in most of these advanced economies. All right, so let me close out there. Um, I hope that gives you some sense for some of the big global changes and some of the economic context for what you're seeing in the policy and political domain. Um, I am happy to answer any questions. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been said that uh, the cost of energy in the United States is going to drop so significantly that jobs are going to go back to the US, from, especially from China, because of their cost of energy. What is your impression of that? So I don't, I don't buy that. Um, the cost of energy, so there's two aspects to this. Okay? So one is the cost of primary energy, primarily gas. Uh, and that's, so this is because of the whole shale boom, you know, all of the, the fracking and all of that, right? So the cost of gas has fallen significantly. It used to be about 12 or $13 per unit in 2007. Uh, it fell to about $4 a unit. It's like a massive drop in shale gas, in, in, in natural gas. Um, that has resulted in a change in the energy mix. So you see more gas in power generation. It has also resulted in a lot of investment coming in, especially from places like Trinidad. Uh, in things like petrochemicals, you know, fertilizers, that sort of stuff. So any kinds of industries that use a lot of gas in their input are coming to the US. Um, that is not a lot of industries. The vast majority of manufacturing industries don't use gas as the primary input, right? I mean, outside of petrochemicals and steel, to some extent, you know, you know you're not going to build automobile plants in the US because gas prices are cheaper, right? Um, then you have to look at the second aspect, which is gas in the power mix and have electricity prices come down as a result. And what you find there is sort of a mixed story because state by state, the electricity rules change. The electricity prices did come down to some extent. But then if you take a longer view, you know, the US electricity prices were, have already been substantially lower than in most parts of China for a very long time. And so you don't see much evidence of Chinese operations moving back to the US. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence, right? You see a lot of kind of media articles about like companies opening, coming back, uh, but you don't see it in the data. And to the extent that jobs are, you're seeing a reinvestment in the US economy, it is either because of the petrochemicals boom or it's because of a demand rebound. So the pe more people buying cars, you know, more people buying machinery and that kind of stuff, you know, it's not made at scale in China to sell to the US anyway, right? That stuff has always been made relatively close to home. Hi, Marcia Forbes, Phase 3 Productions. It's a very small question, but an observation that when you're presenting your graphs, you talk about the outliers driving the um, mean average. And I wonder the extent to which we're not now moving towards probably looking at the mode so that we get a better sense of what is happening than sticking to an arrangement that doesn't work anymore. So I completely agree with that. Um, and this goes back to a discussion we were having at this table, which is this whole idea of measurement. Right? And what, what this is triggering is a lot of soul searching among statisticians to say, what are we even looking at? Do we even know what we're looking at? Um, so part of it is, is looking at the statistical techniques. Do you look at mode versus mean? Do you kind of figure out some other way of doing maybe some regional averages? Part of it is also increasingly in a more digitized economy, like how do you even measure economic value, right? Uh, if a company produces a bunch of things but is not able to monetize what it's producing uh, and the consumers are benefiting from it and you don't see that in the GDP statistics, then is the economy really shrinking? Is it really not growing as much? 
Or is it just that it is growing, but we're not measuring it the way we, it should be measured, right? And so these are things that are being, you know, like this is part of the soul searching going on. Uh, but you're absolutely right. I mean, there's no solutions for these yet, but, but hopefully we'll, we'll find some soon. Um, following up on your comment regarding the measurement issue in terms of quality, to the extent that technology has significantly improved so that you can have less income, and if you think about the quality of what you're actually consuming is significant, um, do you think that could be a material explanatory factor? And related to that, you spoke about that in the past where there has been disruption, for example, the Industrial Revolution, there were new jobs um, in new areas. But to the extent that there is this actual machine learning where the, some of the actual thinking process is actually being done by technology now, does that create a significant issue in terms of the distribution of income going forward, even as these new jobs come about? Um, so on the first question, um, probably, right? So, so it may be that the reason with all this crazy disruption and in income pressures the reason that you don't have pitchforks on the street and we, don't, we haven't had the French Revolution play out yet might be because of, as a consumer, there are still some benefits that we're seeing that haven't been monetized and you, you don't see that on the, on the income side. Having said that, we did some interesting research looking at this consumer surplus angle, right? This whole point of consumer benefits and what you find is in a technology-oriented society, just as companies, some companies see disproportionate income, you also see that some consumers see disproportionate consumer benefits. So one way of thinking about it is, you know, I don't know how many people here have smartphones. I would assume just about everybody in the room has smartphones, right? Some of us use it to check our email. Some of, it run, run off, some of us run our whole lives on that phone, right? I mean, I have colleagues who will use their phone to schedule work, to transfer money, to find all kinds of things. Whereas all I'm doing is sitting out there watching, I was going to say watching YouTube clips, but of course I don't watch YouTube clips. Um, <laughs> But, but you know what I mean? So, so even as individuals, the way we participate in the consumer benefits varies widely, right? And so we did one study where we said 20% of consumers are capturing about two-thirds of all the consumer benefit. So you still see the same kind of inequality, even at the consumer side. Um, on, the second, on the second point, you know, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. It could be that with all the machine learning and all of that stuff, there's a pace of acceleration. There's an acceleration in the, in the displacement and that is coming to for high skill workers in a way that it didn't in the past, right? And so that would tell you that, yes, in, at least in the near term, you will probably see a continuous increase in the way income is distributed to a relatively small number of companies and industries. And that's my point that, you know, I think these kinds of structural changes, they're not gonna fix themselves, right? And they may fix themselves, but it may take, you know, 25, 30, 40 years for, for us to, to get to a point where there's another equilibrium. Um, so the question is, what do we do in the interim, right? How do you create adjustments for that? Um, Sri, thanks for that presentation. Um, when, when you look at the, the fact that, that developed countries now, UK, US, for example, are more trying to look inwards to protect their own consumers, what, what's the implication for lesser developed countries? Are they going to be more shut out from the, um, these markets? Are they going to be shut out from the yeah, markets? Yeah. Um, it's, it's difficult to say, you know, I think because, first of all, and this, this is my point about, you know, I don't know what the specific policies will be because there is a, we've had 30, 35 years of this massive growth in supply chains. There are significant um, interests to preserve the status quo, right? And so you already kind of see that. So if you look at the whole border adjustment thing in the US, and this notion of like, you know, can we change things so that there's an export subsidy and then there's an import tariff, already all the retailers in the US are, are up in arms, right? Because they're basically saying, look, this is not gonna work for us because we import a lot of the stuff, and if you raise import tariffs, we, we're gonna go out of business. And so the exact nature of how this is going to play out is very difficult to tell. And it may be at the end of the day that nothing changes this time. Um, the implications, I think, from a, from a developing economy standpoint, I think there is, it's quite possible that there will be a, a, a slowdown. I don't think it is a structural slowdown. It may be sort of a temporary pause in, in how supply chains open up, in how companies make, think of making these investments. Um, and, but I think in the long run, you know, what we've said is that this has to continue, right? You have to have more participation because that's the only way you, you raise productivity levels for everybody. So I would say that in the long run, I don't expect to see significant changes. But the question is like in the short term, right? Um, you might see some kind of muted uh, 
muted behavior on the part of these advanced economies in terms of getting more investment to come to, to, to developing countries. But it's, it's, it's hard for me to say. I mean, I think that's the, that's the thing that we're all grappling with is like, you know, what do you do in this sort of situation, right? So I think at the minimum, what we've been advising our clients is to at least run scenarios, right? What, what would you do if something changed? Because that risk adjusted uh, perspective is something that is becoming more important now. Uh, good morning. morning. Um, most of the time when we talk about, when persons talk about um, labor market growth, we tend to be like an all or nothing situation. So for example, is either my company is in China, in, um, employing Chinese workers, or it's in Jamaica, employing Jamaican workers. Um, have we considered a scenario where, for example, let's look at the US. If you bring up a company that is in China employing 3,000 Chinese workers back to the US, but you allow them to bring in a thousand of those Chinese workers and, and, two, and employ 2,000 Americans because you tend to be a situation where you bring them back, you lock the market to immigrants, so it's all our local workers. But if the labor cost in that country is, is, is that much lower, where is the incentive to bring back the company or the jobs to your local market if you cannot mix the, the, the workforce to, to, to keep the labor cost low when you migrate the company? So, um, I have a couple of thoughts on this. One is, I, from the data, I cannot see a trend of companies that were in China employing lots of Chinese workers, closing shop, moving back to the US. Whether they employ US workers or not is another story. I don't even see them moving back to the US. I see a lot of the anecdotes, right? I see, for instance, the, the newspaper article about the, about the apparel manufacturer that used to make shirts in China and has now moved to the US and is now opening a factory there. That's great. The problem is, as that company was doing that, the US still lost 35,000 apparel manufacturing jobs in the last five years during the manufacturing recovery, right? A bunch of apparel manufacturing outfits shut down in the US. Where did they go? They went either to China or they went to Vietnam or Cambodia or Bangladesh or those sorts of places, right? So the fundamental dynamics in some of these industries have not changed. That's one point. The second point is there is a general trend of um, companies kind of looking at the labor cost issue and saying, okay, you know, there is sort of a, if you look at where automation is going and the cost of automation has been falling significantly relative to the cost of labor, right? And so you do see a lot of companies that are starting to automate their, their plants. And to the extent that you see more automation in those sorts of processes, that reduces the impact of labor cost in your equation. Right? And so you're seeing some companies making those changes. And then the third point I would make is that when you look at what has driven the surge in US manufacturing in the last five years, so there's been about a million jobs that were created in the last five years, which is a big deal considering you know, we lost so many in, in the last decade. Right? Those one million jobs are not jobs that came back from China. Those are jobs that came back in industries that never went to China in the first place, right? They were industries, um, let me give you an example, right? So in 2005, in 2006, there were about 15 million cars that were sold in the US, okay? Cars that are sold in the US are not made in China, right? It's not, it's prohibitive. The transport costs are prohibitive. You make them relatively close to home. You might make them in, you might assemble them in Mexico, you might assemble them somewhere else, but you, you assemble them in the region. So in 2005, there were 15 million cars. By 2010, the 15 million had come down to 8 million. So if you're in a capital-heavy industry and your market has suddenly dropped in half because people aren't buying, half your companies are going to go out of business, right? Which is exactly what happened. Those companies put pressure on the supply chain, the domestic suppliers, most of them went out of business. By 2014, we were back at 15, 16 million cars being sold, right? That demand is what has driven the manufacturing recovery. So if you think about car manufacturers opening up plants again, they are buying more rubber and plastics and fabricated metals and electronics from their local suppliers. That has driven a revitalization of the, of the domestic supply chain in the US. Right? So it's not really a China story. Uh, it is those sorts of industries which, by the way, are quite labor intensive. Even though they are automation heavy, they employ a lot of people. Right? And so that's kind of my, so, so this narrative of the labor costs in China you know, sort of doing something and then a bunch of guys coming back to the US is not, I don't actually see that in the data. Which is why my point about the incomes is such a big issue, right? Because at the end of the day, if it's really about the market and the incomes that people have, if that's what's driving your, your economy, you better make sure that you don't have the, the dynamic that we have right now, where incomes are under pressure and most people say they're not able to get by. 
Okay, so this morning's topic is global expectations, predicting economic trends in an uncertain global environment and the implications for Jamaican companies. So we have this morning, again, Mr. Jermaine Borrell, who is the Senior Economist and Sovereign Research Manager at the JMMB Group. We have Mr. Dennis Strong, CEO of the Private Sector Organization of Jamaica. And we have Mr. Mauricio Polito, who is the CEO of GB Energy. And I'm just going to ask Jermaine to just share his perspective on the topic. And then we'll just move on to Dennis and Mauricio. And then we'll just ask for questions from the floor. Um, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, my perspective on the topic. Um, there are a lot of things happening in the global marketplace now. We can look as far as Brexit in the UK, where um, basically the UK has voted that the citizenry is of the view that, listen, um, they're having challenges in terms of the movement of labor from the Eastern, Eastern European regions into the UK. And on the basis of that challenge, they are seeing where um, a lot of the jobs are actually going to these persons from the Eastern European regions. Also, based on the European Union laws and regulations, everyone is actually to be treated equally. And apparently for the people in the, in the UK, this is a significant challenge. However, um, if you look at the structure of the vote, what has really happened is that it's primarily the older persons in the population that have really voted on that basis to really leave the UK. What we're, sorry, to really leave the EU. What we're seeing now, however, is that there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of backlash. There are persons who are very concerned about their future. They are looking at the challenges in terms of you no know, access to employment, etc. And that has really resulted in the forecast for growth for the UK be revised um, downwards. There are further challenges, especially in terms of the other members of the union. As we all know, the UK is made up of um, Scotland, um, Ireland, and you know, Wales. And there are other parts of that UK union, in particular Scotland, that actually voted to stay within the European Union. So the challenge now is that maybe Scotland will have another referendum to decide whether or not they want to be a part of the UK Union. The problem with that is that um, Scotland is considered to be the oil capital of the EU, and also Scotland represents one third of the landmass of the UK Union. So having Scotland out of the UK Union represents a much weaker UK. And what we have seen is a situation where you have a weaker pound, no, um, most persons are suggesting that you short the pound, that is actually to sell the pound um, for a more stronger currency. When you look at the United States, there are also other challenges there. Um, we spoke a lot about um, what was happening with the change in terms of the, the new president. However, other global factors exist. For example, now we are seeing where the Fed is really looking or has been in an interest rate um, hiking cycle. So the increase in interest rates has actually meant that the global um, benchmark for risk has actually gone up. So what that, what that means is that for those um, countries that actually are in emerging market economies, including Jamaica, what you will see is a situation where our global bonds, the yields, generally speaking, should be trending on an, on an upward basis. Now, if that's the case, I mean, for those countries that are looking to issue debt or to raise financing on the international capital market, the cost of that financing um, should be looking to go up. Other things happening on the global market space, um, we see Venezuela. Uh, this is a country that is um, you know, very intricately or very important to Jamaica on the basis of our Petrocarib agreement. Now, what's happening with Venezuela is that um, over the years, there have been a lot of changes in terms of how the economy operates. There has been a lot of nationalization of industries. And effectively, what it has, what it has caused is that Venezuela is primarily an oil-dependent economy now, with about 95% about of exports actually related to hydrocarbon issues. Now, with that being said, 
Um, we also recognize that there are challenges in terms of the government, you know, how the government is operating, how it is ruling, the fact that economic growth has really stagnated, the fact that there are challenges in terms of getting access to external commodities. So that is proving a massive challenge um, for Venezuela right now. And it has significant implications for us in the Caribbean, particularly because of the Petro-Caribbean arrangement. Other issues um, that we can look at, Puerto Rico now is also going through um, their challenges. They are actually in default, and you know, that's something that's very important for bond, for bondholders. And how this default actually plays out will have implications for the wider emerging market economies. Um, what I can also say is that for those of us in the region, because of the increase in um, interest rate environment now, you know, driven by the US federal authorities, we have a challenge in the Caribbean region. And that challenge is, for most of us, um, Jamaica, Trinidad, the Dominican, well, they are to a lesser extent. But for most economies in Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, etc., we're having challenges with economic growth. Now, the problem is we need to keep interest rates low in order to foster or to allow for greater credit expansion. But the challenge is we're in an increase in interest rate um, environment globally. So central bankers will be having a lot of challenges in terms of finding that appropriate policy mix. So that's just um, a touch of, of some of the challenges that exist out there, and I'll allow the other members Dennis. of the panel. Um, OK, thank you. Um, you realize the church is uncomfortable, right? <laughs> you know, it's not for old people. Um, but good morning, everyone. You know, the, the presentation by Sri this morning was very interesting. Eh? It, it, really, it really shared a lot of perspective on, on what is really driving a lot of these policy issues. I thought it was just insanity, but obviously there are some, there are some more logical reasons behind it. Um, you know, when we're thinking about this topic, one of the things that came to mind is that maybe the only thing that is certain about today's global environment is that there is uncertainty. Um, you know, Jermaine mentioned Brexit. We have the, the policies being pursued by the Trump administration, North Korea, um, the ambitions of Putin, and the, the global threat that's faced from terrorism and um, Syria, and also very instrumental, I think, is the fact that the US has pulled out of the Paris Agreement. I think that also is very instrumental because it's, it's gonna have a significant impact on us if we don't address this issue of climate change. And what they, they lead to, all these things lead to is greater uncertainty. And what's clear is that businesses, however, must survive. And, and, and therefore, it's going to be very important to make predictions and, and more importantly, accurate predictions about what's going to happen. And therefore, people like Damon is here. People like Damon is going to be very important because it's all going to be about risk management and how you assess risk uh, going forward. The, the risk person is actually going to be one of the most important person, I think, in an organization right now. So we talk about skills, looking at skills look into the future. It's all going to be about risk and how you manage risk. Because certainly as um, these, these various events happen and the scenarios change, you're going to have to be a lot more nimble. You know, um, Sri spoke to workers moving between um, locations. It, it's not just going to be locations within the country but also outside of the country. Um, so therefore, setting up people for, for skills that they can actually transcend borders is going to be very important. It's, it's not just about learning to operate in your own country, but how are you going to operate outside of a country? And there are various things that come to mind. And for me, CARICOM therefore becomes very important again because uh, one of the issues we've been discussing about CARICOM in, in terms of getting it moving and the CSME is, for example, the harmonization of laws. 
and, and understanding what laws relate to what country and how can people move between countries, that's going to be very important. Um, we, for example, have a, a sub, an oversupply of, of labor. Other countries in the region have an oversupply of goods, you know, our, our, our businesses. How can we facilitate um, that economic improvement within our own region? So I think CARICOM is definitely on the agenda again, you know, um, particularly with the fact that Trinidad and Barbados has seen a very difficult time now. I think that what's going to happen is that um, Trinidad, Trinidad and Barbadian companies are going to be looking towards moving their, their own whole production process to Jamaica and producing where the market is. You know, that's a great opportunity for us. However, we, while we recognize all of that and the fact that CARICOM is going to be important as a, within the region and also as a trading block, because as countries move to protect themselves, they want to, they want to negotiate with blocks now. They don't want to negotiate with one country. So we have to make this thing work. But what's going to be important for me is that Jamaica needs to look within our own processes and how we're going to improve. Uh, we did a study recently. Remember when we were having the issue, Steve, you were on that committee, or, or it was Butch, um, looking at the whole Trinidad-Jamaica situation. What we found is that 85% of the challenges that we face with Trinidad from that study that was done, it was held by Howard Mitchell, um, was actually internally generated. So of, of the, all the challenges we were having, 85% of it was caused by challenges relating to either customs or, or bureaucracy within Jamaica. So therefore, even if we were to fix the issues that we had with Trinidad, we'd still be at a significant disadvantage because of those issues that we face internally. So for me, as we prepare for the uncertainty, it's very important for us to fix what's happening internally. That's the only way for us, I think, to address it. Address it. And as I said, CARICOM is going to be important, but you know, with, with all these technological changes and everything, um, I, I, I look again at the, the whole matter of the logistics environment, for, for example. We have a huge advantage um, from a natural point of view, um, the geographic location, the infrastructure that we have, which we need to pay more attention to investing in it. But we're still not going to be able to operate if we're not productive from a bureaucracy point of view, um, from a labor market point of view. Um, we're, we're going to be seeing companies, for example, um, wanting to move into Jamaica, right? But if we don't fix the productivity issues that we're having, then we're going to have a problem. If we don't fix, for example, we're focusing a lot, PB spoke to it this morning on the exchange rate, which is really a symptom of the challenges that we have. If we don't focus, for example, on the labor market reform and getting that done, then the, the fact is that all the advantages and all the shifts that we see globally are going to be meaningless unless we address those issues. And then let's not talk about crime also. So while we have these uncertainties happening globally, what it really does is complicate the issues that we already have internally. And therefore, we still have a lot of work to do internally. For me, it's an advantage because what it means is that there is a performance gap. And, and that is why I think so many companies are looking to invest in Jamaica because they recognize that we have this performance gap, that if we just do a few things right, we're going to be able to fix. At the end of the day, in closing, um, it's going to be very important for us to focus on how we negotiate um, um, with, with other regions. And also, we have to look at the fact that you know, companies like Grace Kennedy, for example, um, I'm sure National is looking that way also, are looking to invest overseas because as complications happen and uncertainties in markets overseas, it's, it's better for you to be, up, to be in that country and producing in that country. So what is it going to mean for us from a job market point of view? What it means is that we have to be more innovative. We have to 
create new industries internally. We have to drive our SME sector. And very importantly, we have to push that labor productivity. OK. <clears throat> um, good morning. Um, I would like at this moment to land a little bit of everything that we have seen around the world to what is happening right now in Jamaica. And I found it uh, very interesting that uh, I see a lot of optimism around us now that I hadn't seen before. And in fact, uh, we know that this government has a genuine intent to grow, and they have clearly expressed so, and they have also said that even if they don't have all the resources, they will facilitate for other companies to come in. Things like the creation of the Economic Growth Council are things that are really, really positive. They have based eight strategies that will really help us drive the economic growth from, from the actual growth to 5% in four years. And with that in mind and turning to the global side, uh, one of the pillars is to improve the security. We, we all know that we have a, a big security issue in Montego Bay that needs to be addressed to help improve the numbers. The moment we address this, the crime situation, growth will come by default. So with that, um, the Economic Growth Council touched on other countries like Colombia that had similar situations uh, in a similar city called Medellin where they have the same situation that Montego Bay between the gangs and the killings and all that. And nowadays, Medellin is a city that is considered one of the most uh, prominent and developed of, of the world in terms of what they did to overcome that situation, which was very similar to that. With that in mind, the, the Economic Growth Council established the contact and the, the General Anderson, the National Security Advisor, went to Colombia, captured some ideas there to try to implement here. We also brought President Uribe from Colombia. Uh, for those of you that don't know about him, this is a president that the last day of his second term, he had 86% popularity and could not be reelected because of the constitution. But what was most interesting about this experience of President Uribe coming to Jamaica, he spent two days talking to the private sector, to the government, to the unions, to everybody. The most interesting thing was that by the time he took government in 2002 in Colombia, it was the exact same situations that we're facing now. Colombia was growing at 2% rate, right? It had a lot of uh, security issues, crime issues. There was not confidence and trust in the country. And he managed to turn it all around to, in eight, eight years, to a point where Colombia was growing to 8%. And he based that in, in three important pillars that we may want to adopt some of them here. One was um, democratic security, which was controlling all this thing of the crime and moving people to trust the country more. And uh, second was to improve foreign investment. And third was to do social programs in the long term. So with the democratic security, he managed to, to build a lot of trust both outside and inside the country. And it brought the, the the investment from outside, like from three billion to seven billion. But the most important thing that happened that I think is gonna happen here is that the 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 people the industrial people from the country start investing more heavily in their country and not outside. The investment grew from twenty five billion to seventy five billion. So it was significantly and, and that helped the the country improve a lot. So the um, also a uh, the fact that they could uh, overcome the security issue brought growth as well uh, to, to the country because, um, because people started moving to recent develop more. People could move between the cities by car without being afraid of being kidnapped or, or being bombed or something like that. So this, 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 I can tell you that the government is doing a big effort to control the crime situation in Mobe, which we need. Tourism is growing fantastically well in Jamaica, and it's uh, situations like ISIS, it's out the world, is making more people from Europe and other places want to come here instead of other Mediterranean locations. So we really need to focus on that and help improve that opportunity that we have in Jamaica. We also saw that employment plays a, a very important role in the world uh, growth and economy. And I think that we have a big issue here. We have uh, new generations that are coming out very well prepared from very good universities. But the private sector has a big challenge to provide 
interesting jobs for them to stay because most of them want to go and work outside. That's why we have a diaspora that is about 3 million people when we have 2.8 million people living here. So we need to do a big effort to make sure that this talent that is growing up can stay here and could add to the country and benefit it all. So also, uh, I wanted to mention that I'm happy to see that Jamaica is going out of the, a little bit out of the CARICOM scheme and is looking at other countries like Dominican Republic and, and, and Colombia. Dominican Republic is growing at 7% rate per year. And there's a lot of people that have, of Dominican Republic that want to do business here in Jamaica, and a lot of people from Jamaica that want to do business in Dominican Republic, like the case of JMNB that has established very well there. So there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, it, was a, it is the first time since 1970 that the Prime Minister goes to Dominican Republic. He has established a very good relation with, with President Danilo, and there, that in, comes with a lot of teams from the different sectors that can go and participate over there. So there's a big potential there, there as well. So with that, I think that's right. what I have. So we have joining us now Dr. Horton. He's a lecturer in the Department of Economies at the University of West Indies, and he's now gonna share his perspective. So the global growth projection for 2017 is roughly 3.5%. And as global geopolitical tension increases, there is a lot of room for countries, especially small island developing states such as Jamaica, to increase their growth prospects. Now, when I speak to my clients, I, I, all, I often refer to, to us as uh, really being on the brink of explosion. So I make the comparison between two oak trees, one of them 20 meters high and the other about two meters high. And the more developed countries, for example, America, the EU, and so on, they, I refer to as those oak trees that are 20 meters high. But the developing countries such as Jamaica, et cetera, et cetera, I look at them as those oak trees that are two meters high. Uh, as a result, they have a lot of room to grow. It is just the environment now in which they are that will really harness how important or how, move, how significant we move along this growth trajectory. Recent research by the IMF has outlined that the income inequality and increasing the share of income that goes to the top 20 percentile of, of, of the wealth in a country or people who have that particular wealth in a country reduces economic growth by 0.08 percent. The results also indicated that whenever there's an increase in the amount of income uh, made available to the people at the lower 20 percentile of a country, then GDP growth will also increase. So th th there's, a, there's, a, there's a distinction now between how we approach economic activity and what exactly we want to achieve. Now in Jamaica, we have a Ministry of Economic Growth that neglects development. This Ministry of Economic Growth also relinquishes stability to IMF and their advice and the doing business environment. Now, in any country, for us to really move forward meaningfully, there has to be a balance between the resources that is provided to the firm as well as the resources that are being made available to the household. If, for example, you're in a country and the government only is concerned about increasing the doing business environment and there's a significant effort to increase the amount of resources available for the firm to grow, but there is a neglect for the households and, and a neglect for the labor input into the firm's productive process, then you realize that that leads to antagonism because one, the household budget constraint will not be satisfied, so they have to do on-the-job hustling which distracts them from the main activity that the business should be carrying out in the first place. Now, economic activity continues, but it is not recorded because a lot of these people have to do what we call hustle on the side within the same business that, that they work, and, and, and this leads to a reduction in, in the GDP and the amount of aggregate output increase that is captured on a formal level. Now, the dynamics of the economy is important because as third world economies are developing economies, we have to understand that the, the, the labor input into the production process is becoming more and more important because the, technologic, the technological advancement is so pervasive, then you need more skilled labor to really help the business to grow. So, 
in essence, the, the, the trajectory that the world is moving on now is important, and it is important for us to understand that the household and the resources made available to them will help to alleviate the burden on the government in the long run so that the country itself can increase its possibilities for economic growth. Okay, thank you, Dr. Horton. Are there any questions from the floor? But in the presentation, there was something quite interesting, and I think that it provides an opportunity for us here in Jamaica. Um, what was said in the presentation is that there is a movement towards automation in time in a lot of areas in terms of careers, and I think here in Jamaica, we need to plan for it. I think that the university needs to look at how do we prepare our students for a future where it's mostly automation? How do we direct them to move away from studying in areas that will become obsolete as against moving to area where, where areas where there will be rapid growth? There's also something else that um, is a pet peeve for production and manufacturing here in Jamaica is that we don't have a lot of people who think innovation. And in production and manufacturing, if there is no innovation, then what happens is that the productive sector and the manufacturing sector actually declines and falls apart. We have recognized that our children actually spend more time on the phone and the iPad and everything else than anything. In fact, the average parent in here will probably tell you that if they need to speak to the child and, and have a, a real conversation, it might be WhatsApp. faster to WhatsApp or, or text <laughs> them. And recognizing that, I think that um, I'm, I'm going to ask you the question. Has the university looked at how do we communicate to our students on a wider level using the technology as against the colonial system of having them sit down in a classroom yes. between eight to five or eight to nine in the night and a traditional teacher stand-up training process. It is a lot cheaper to communicate like this. I think all our students adapt very quickly to communication by electronics. Mm -hmm. There are none of them that are stupid. We have many of them who don't have enough opportunity to actually sit down in the eight to five classroom. But I think as a country, if we are going to prepare ourselves for the future and become competitive, we need to have something to sell, like China. And it can't be just simply cheap labor. I think we can have an educated labor force. We just have not looked at how do we educate our people effectively and educate them in such a way that they are prepared for the future. And I'd love to hear your comments on this. Yes, thanks so much. The, the the, the truth is, the, the labor gap or the, the mismatch between what we train our millennials for and what they end up actually doing is, 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 is still uh, in existence. Uh, what we recognize at the UWI is that how people learn is also changing and we've tried to input this in, in how we teach. However, the UWI is still a traditional institution. And because it's a traditional institution, it, it maintains certain traditional way of doing things that it makes difficult for us as young people or the younger generation to really maneuver the way of thinking to meet what, what the projections. The, 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 the issue is that education continues to be expensive, especially education along the lines of technology. We've recognized that there is a gap However, the teaching of it is, is done informally. For example, how you market on, on social media, et cetera, et cetera, how you, you interact, how you teach on social media. It's really done on an informal basis. So I guess the transition, we're in a transition process, and from our generation to the next generation, we'll be in a better position. But it is important for us to take this point. We have to look at creating the value-added jobs and creating jobs up the, 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 the technological chain and move out of the thinking of just minimum wage jobs that, 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 that are really not helping the household to satisfy their budget constraint. 
government policy drives productivity down. The labor laws that says that if you catch someone stealing on camera and you carry them to the IDT and they still win, or you have to reinstate an unproductive worker, those things are killing productivity in this country. We cannot continue um, just, just tinkering at the edges and thinking we can change various things when we, we're, we're, we're saying to people, um, you can hire people, but you, if, if, they, if they do something, if they're unproductive and they, they still you can't fire them. Right? That, I think, is killing it. The, the IDB did a study about five years ago um, which showed that labor in the region and in Jamaica in particular is, is getting more and more informal. The reason for that is because if you know that you stand the chance of not being able to deal with an unproductive worker, then you're going to hire them on short-term contracts. You're not going to give them permanent employment. So what the laws in Jamaica are doing is actually causing greater unproductivity, but it is also causing a greater fiscal problem down the road when these people who are not formal have no retirement benefits and all of that. So for me, it's, it's policy that drives it. If you look in the US, for example, it's policy that drives it also. You know, um, this thing about Donald Trump saying he's going to bring back jobs in the coal markets and all that, that's not going to happen. I mean, markets don't work like that. You know, if, if you don't have policies that encourage productivity, it, it's just like productivity of capital. Our regulator environment locks up capital and say you can't work, and then you say, why is it unproductive? And for me, it's, it's just a, a, a shift that needs to happen at policy level. Um, so PB spoke about us focusing, for example, all of our efforts on stable exchange rate, when the real problem is labor productivity. Unless we address that, then it will continue to decline. Well, uh, back again here. Um, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to spend uh, these precious moments and, and hear for what's happening around the world and how it's affecting uh, Jamaica as well. Uh, I think that you have not realized that you gain a lot today because you're not part of a problem anymore. You're part of a solution. The fact that we have spent time learning and seeing other perspectives and see how we can improve Jamaica, it's a big difference. And I really invite you to spread all these things that you, get, that you learn here with your colleagues, friends, and family so we start generating more trust in the country and more confidence on what is happening so we can start seeing growth in its full capacity. Uh, I think that today uh, we had a very, very good presenters, uh, starting with uh, P.V. Scott as the president of the, of the PSOJ. Um, he really made it clear for us that the, part of the solution is that we need to improve our productivity. That is significantly, uh, and it starts with all of you. It starts with all of your work. It starts with the attitude that is deployed in every work that is going to make us different and is going to help the, the growth. Uh, he mentioned that there has to be changes in the labor laws, in the education, in the long-term programs, and he explained factors as the exchange rate that could move up and down depending on where it's supposed to be, but definitely the country has done very well in keeping the fiscal policy and improving its position of debt in front of GDP. Uh, as you have seen in the results, and you're going to see it on the 27th of July in the economic growth uh, presentation, that there's things that have been happening and, and, and things are being achieved. We're now not in 140% in debt versus GDP, but we're close to 120 and probably moving less, which is a much better position, and the goal is to bring it close to 100, which is not good, but it's much definite, definitely better than, than where we, we started. Uh, we also have a Minister of Foreign Affairs, Camille Johnson, explaining on the importance of, of the diaspora and how we can make the the diaspora come and, and interact with the locals to see how can we promote more jobs and how they can invest more heavily in Jamaica and the growth of the country. And then obviously we have the, the keynote speaker, Sri, who made a, an excellent presentation of how he sees economic growth in the, in the world and how it's affected by, by key things like, uh, like uh, demand, like productivity, 
and like income. So I think that this leaves us a, a big picture of what's going around. I definitely insist that, that we are in paradise. Probably you heard that on, on one of my articles that was put on me later, but I definitely sustain it. The more you look around the world and the more you travel, you find that Jamaica is on an excellent opportunity for growing, and we have very nice people, and we have the blessing that, that people want to come over here. Just to share with you guys, in the 27th of November, we're going to have the United Nations World Tourist Organization conference in Jamaica. It's the first time this conference is held in a country outside of the, in the Western Hemisphere. And it was impressive to see when they took the decision, when Jamaica was put to the front as an option, how everybody reacted positively and unanimously said Jamaica is the place to come. So we were gonna have 154 countries, more than a thousand people in the Montego Bay Convention Center, and that is going to bring a lot to Jamaica as well. So in closing, um, we saw that definitely for, for achieving economic growth, we need to work on productivity and employment. Uh, I've seen in the five years of being in Jamaica that we, we are in a strict need of uh, making sure that our talented youngsters or millenniums that are coming out get an opportunity to stay here and add value to the economy instead of going away. So please, it's a, it's a, let's make sure that in our companies we provide space for youngsters to come and share, share the, their knowledge and get the experience here and add to the economy growth. Um, well, and thank you very much to all the sponsors to make, for making this happen. We should have more, more types of these uh, events where we get the knowledge. And I would like to reinforce on what Michael Lee Chin said, that we have uh, the best and most beautiful studies of everything here in Jamaica, but we have no execution. So please, let's change that formula. We know the strategy is already there, so let's go to 99% execution. Thank you very much. Thank you.